The Last Dance was one of the hottest documentaries this year. Even though the real last dance of Michael Jordan happened five years after the story in the doc, in 2001, Jordan unretired for the second time and suited up in a blue Wizards jersey. Some people say that his two Wizards years tarnished his legacy, and some praised MJ even more. So what's the real truth? And how good was Jordan in Washington? Was he really washed? Or did he prove once more that he's the GOAT? Watch the rest of the video to find out. After the Last Dance In 1998, MJ and Phil Jackson went to the karaoke bar, and Jordan chose The Careless Whisper by George Michael and sang, I'm never gonna dance again, the way I danced with you, looking gently in Phil's direction. Okay, I totally made that up, but Jordan indeed said that he wouldn't be playing unless it's for Phil Jackson. Since the Bulls GM Jerry Krause didn't want to re-sign Phil, and Scottie Pippen wanted to get his first massive paycheck, the Bulls fell apart and MJ fulfilled his promise and retired for the second time. And then in January of 2000, Michael came back to the NBA, but he didn't wear a jersey. Instead, he slipped into a suit and tie as a minority owner and president of basketball operations for the Washington Wizards. The team was bad and finished that year with a 29-53 record, and they got even worse next year with 10 wins less. But there was hope on the horizon. They got the number one pick. MJ had the chance to get a blue chip prospect, and he famously opted for Kwame Brown, the number one high school player in the country. Jordan saw something in Kwame, and he believed he is the cornerstone that will immediately turn the Wizards into a winning ball club. Also, he knew a guy pretty good at basketball, a guy who was on the floor with the team at every practice and who was itching to make another comeback. It's an itch that still needs to be scratched, and I want to make sure this itch doesn't bother me for the rest of my life. I'm just going to play the game of basketball that I love. It's not about the money. Indeed, it wasn't about the money. Jordan the GM gave Jordan the player the smallest salary on the Wizards, and MJ gave all of it to the victims of the 9-11 terrorist attack. It really was just about the game for him, and because of that competitive fire that never ceased to burn, and that voice in the head who kept telling him he is still better than the young guys who took over the league from him. How good were the Wizards? The Wizards had a young Richard Hamilton, who was in his third year and who was turning to be one of the most promising shooting guards in the league. And that was about it when it comes to quality players with potential. The rest were either older veterans on their way out or young role players. Of course, there was also Kwame Brown, who, by the time the season started, was already crushed by Jordan, who insulted him at any chance he got. Jordan never changed his ways. And just like he trash-talked all of his opponents, teammates, and Jerry Krause, he was maybe even worse to Kwame. A 19-year-old kid couldn't take it, and he played with zero confidence and was basically unusable on the court. Nobody on the team averaged more than 10 points that year, other than Rip Hamilton and Jordan. The Wizards were the same team that won 19 games the year prior, plus Jordan and Kwame. MJ thought it would be enough to be competitive, but he overstated his team and himself. Return of the Mac before the season, Jordan was working tirelessly to get himself in shape. He trained every day with his personal trainer, Tim Grover, and held private training camps with various NBA players to get himself in game shape. So, when the season started, Jordan wasn't rusty. In the first two weeks of the season, Jordan scored over 30 in four of his eight games. In the ninth, he poured 44 on the Jazz, picking up right where he left off in 1998. After the first 10 games, he averaged 27.4 points, 6.3 rebounds, 4 assists, and 2 steals. And it seemed like he had never left, as his stats were virtually the same to the 1998 regular season. He was in the MVP race and made it easy for the world to fall in love with him once again. However, his play wasn't reflected in the team record, as the Wizards only notched two games in the win column. They started the season 5-12 and 12, and were at the bottom of the Eastern Conference. Also. Jordan's stellar play at the beginning of the season wasn't sustainable at the age of 38. He was still Michael Jordan, but he wasn't Air Jordan anymore, or at least not all the time. And even though his totals were still looking good, Mike became an inefficient volume scorer on a bad team. He shot 40% in those first 17 games, a landslide from his career average of 50%. MJ was still fundamentally sound, he could still see every play, and he was still 6'6", six six, strong and confident, but he didn't have the same speed and he didn't have the legs under him to shoot efficiently. But if you know anything about Jordan, you know that he hates losing more than anything. After those 17 games and a 5-12 record, the Wizards won 9 in a row, 
then they lost a couple. And in the second of those two losses, MJ had the worst game of his career. In 25 minutes on the floor, he shot two out of 10 and finished the game with six points, which snapped his record 866 game streak of double figures scoring, and the media went ballistic. After the game, Jordan was down on himself. On the bus ride from the arena, he sat next to Doug Collins, whom he hired to be the coach, and asked him, do you think I can still play? Collins said, yeah, of course. I only took you out because we were down by 25 in the fourth and wanted to keep you fresh for the next game. MJ was satisfied and said he did the right thing, but he needed the confirmation and the assurance that his coach still believed in his abilities. Two nights later, he responded in a big way. He scored the first three times he had the ball, and he finished the game with 51 points, going 21 for 38 from the field. He was the oldest player ever to score 50 in an NBA game. He followed that up with a 45 point, 10 rebounds, 7 assists, 3 steal effort against the New Jersey Nets, including scoring 22 points in a row during one stretch. In the game against the Cavaliers, the Wizards were down by a point, with 1.6 seconds left. Michael then hit a mid-range jumper for the last buzzer beater of his career. In a game against his former club, after enduring Ron Mercer's trash talk and having his jumper blocked, he responded by pinning Mercer's layup against the backboard with two hands and trash talking him on the way back up the court. It was a game-winning play and one of the most spectacular blocks by Jordan or anyone for that matter. It was even more impressive that it was done by a 39-year-old who spent his last three years playing golf, drinking, and smoking cigars. By the end of the season, Jordan notched back-to-back 40-point -back games but also four more games where he failed to reach double figures. And that's where the answer lies about Jordan's time with the Wizards. Yeah, he could still play, and yes, he could still be dominant, but it wasn't the kind of dominance we grew accustomed to, and it didn't happen every game. Jordan finished the year early due to a knee injury that required surgery, and the Wizards didn't make the playoffs with a 37-45 and record. MJ played 60 games in the 2001-02 season, and he averaged 23 points, 5.7 rebounds, and 5.2 assists. Those numbers look great in a vacuum, but when you look at Jordan's efficiency, you can quickly tell he didn't have an overly successful season. Jordan took 22 shots per game, far more than he should have for a player shooting 41% from the floor and 19% from three. He was second to last in effective field goal percentage out of all players who qualified for the stat, and 169th out of 177 qualified for true scoring percentage. The Real Last Dance In the offseason, Jordan the GM wanted to help Jordan the player. He traded the best young player on the team, Rip Hamilton, for a more experienced Jerry Stackhouse. Trading away Hamilton was a mistake and Jordan once again proved his short-sightedness in making decisions. The team wasn't that much better, and the season went pretty much the same as the last. Jordan, who was a year older and was battling a lingering knee injury, still had some juice left, but he had to squeeze really hard to get a full cup, and it didn't happen all the time. He scored over 43 times, becoming the first 40-year-old to score over 40 in an NBA game. He also had seven more games where he failed to score 10 points. His defense wasn't at the level it once was, and numerous players took the opportunity to put up numbers against Jordan, something that was unimaginable in previous years. Kobe dropped 55 on him after Jordan taunted him that he could wear the shoes but could never fill them. Michael was more rational with his shots in the second year and shot 44% from the floor, and it was enough for 20 points, 6 rebounds, and 3.8 assists for the season. Jordan played in all 82 games, but once again, the team went 37 and 45 and didn't make the playoffs. The highlight of the year was definitely the All-Star game, where MJ was selected as a reserve after he rejected the offer from Allen Iverson and Tracy McGrady to take their starting spots. He ultimately accepted it from Vince Carter. At halftime, Mariah Carey performed a special tribute to him, donning dresses of both his rookie year Bulls jersey and his final year Wizards jersey as his career highlights played on giant screens behind her. It was a proper send-off, worthy of a star that was Michael Jordan. In the game itself, MJ didn't shoot it particularly well, but he did score 20 points, and most importantly, hit a tough fallaway jumper over Sean Marion to give the East the lead with less than five seconds to play. It appeared to be a game winner, but the West scored again and prevailed in overtime. Still, Jordan proved that he still belongs with the best players in the world at least for one game, even though it was clear he wasn't the best anymore. 
a mediocre dessert to a great meal. If you want a recap of Jordan's time with the Wizards, you'll get different answers depending on who you ask. Jerry Stackhouse said that he wished he had never played in Washington because everything was still going through Michael Jordan, even though it was obvious he wasn't the same player anymore. Kwame Brown was miserable during Jordan's years there, and his career would have certainly been better if he didn't play with MJ as a 19-year-old. The Wizards owner Abe Polin wasn't thrilled with Jordan either, and he relieved him of his GM duties shortly after the last season of Jordan as a player. If we compare Jordan's last years to some of the other NBA greats, we'll see some similarities. The greatest players who ever did it, if they took care of their bodies, were still extremely effective at an advanced age. Tim Duncan was named to the All-NBA and All-Defensive team in 2015. At the age of 39, Kareem made the first team All-NBA in 86, also age 39. And he averaged 26 points in the playoffs that year. Karl Malone averaged 28 and 5 at the age of 39. So it's not unusual that Jordan was still able to play. But maybe the best quote about Jordan's Wizards years came from his agent, David Falk. I just don't think it was a good dessert to a great meal. In the words of De La Soul, Mike was certified hot, and then he dropped to lukewarm. However, that last two years didn't affect his legacy, and the unathletic Jordan, who had to pump fake three times to get a separation for a shot, was soon forgotten. People like to remember the good things, and the lasting image of Jordan will always be that shot over Russell and celebrating his sixth title with a cigar in his mouth.